Good morning, everyone, uh, ladies, gentlemen, friends, colleagues, and our listeners all over the world. Uh, it's my pleasure and the privilege to start with a very, very special webinar uh, together with a, a partnership with the International Society of Nephrology. And we are really proud to present the 2022 update on ISPD guidelines for peritonitis prevention and the treatment. The guidelines were published this year, and I'm really very, very honored to present both speakers, Professor David Johnson and Professor Philip Lee, uh, who are the, 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 oh, the, the major drive for uh, this particular um, guidelines, and they would like to share the, 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 the content of the guidelines with you. And we shall start with Professor David Johnson from Brisbane, Australia to uh, present uh, the new update of ISPD guidelines. David, the floor is yours, or the screen is yours. Thank you very much, uh, Yolanta. And um, uh, I'll, just, uh, I'll just share my screen. I hope that's coming through okay. Yep. All good, okay. So I'll just... So um, the brief I've been asked to uh, speak is about the new 2022 ISPD peritonitis guidelines and specifically we focus on new definitions, new targets and new recommendations for prevention. So before I start, these are my disclosures. So um, what I'll do over the next approximately 25 minutes is first give an overview of the guidelines. I'll then discuss the new definitions and there are quite a few new definitions in this series of the guidelines then measuring, monitoring and reporting of uh, peritonitis, and then uh, uh, prevention of peritonitis, and then I'll um, sum up with my conclusions. And then I'll hand over to Philip for the rest of the, um, the guidelines. So firstly, just doing the guideline overview. Um, as Yolanda mentioned, the um, 2022 ISPD peritonitis guidelines on uh, prevention and treatment update uh, has just been published in the March-April uh, issue of Peritoneal Dialysis International. And basically the guidelines are divided into five sections. So um, uh, the first two sections I'll be dealing with, which are definitions and measurements of peritonitis, uh, prevention of peritonitis, and then Philip will take over addressing treatment, monitoring response to treatment, and return to PD after cessation of PD due to peritonitis related catheter removal. All up, there are 69 recommendations in the new 2022 ISPD guidelines. And one third of those are level one or strong recommendations that uh, we recommend uh, PD clinicians should follow in almost all instances. About just over one fifth of the recommendations are not graded. And then the remainder are level two recommendations which the uh, PD clinician should exercise discretion, uh, discretion in particular patient circumstances as to whether or not they uh, implement. So let's go on to the definitions. As I mentioned, there are uh, quite a few new definitions in the uh, ISPD guidelines. The first one is not a new definition, but I um, emphasize it because it's often not followed um, in, in practice in both clinical quality registries and in um, uh, publication of peritonitis research data. So the ISPD guidelines recommend that peritonitis should be diagnosed when at least two of the following are uh, present. Uh, firstly, clinical features consistent with peritonitis, so that's abdominal pain and or cloudy dialysate effluent. Two, whether dialysate effluent white cell count is greater than 100 per microliter or more than 0.1 by 10 to the 9 per liter with a dwell time of at least two hours. And more importantly, at least 50% of those uh, white cells should be polymorphic nuclear leukocytes. And then thirdly, positive dialysis effluent culture. That's a 1C recommendation. You need at least two out of three of those criteria to diagnose peritonitis. Now, the reason why we emphasize this in the guidelines is that recent literature suggests that um, as a, collectively as a, a PD community, we're not very good at following those or using those definitions. So in this Song PD systematic review, um, we reviewed 59 contemporary randomized control trials and there were 383 different outcome measures for peritonitis. Published in the same year, two years ago, um, uh, our, our group also uh, uh, undertook a systematic review and meta-analysis of 77 randomized control trials. 
And in that um, particular review, 29% didn't prescribe, uh, didn't describe the peritonitis um, criteria that they used to diagnose peritonitis. And 42% actually modified the ISPD peritonitis criteria. Um, and so, for example, there are many variations, such as some units didn't count it when a patient was hospitalized and uh, someone else had taken, like a nurse had taken over the PD care. Some didn't count culture negative peritonitis, uh, unbelievably, um, as, uh, as counting as peritonitis. So it's important to follow the standardized definition so that we can appropriately benchmark between units. Having diagnosed peritonitis, the ISPD guidelines then go on to three categories of definitions. So cause-specific peritonitis, time-specific peritonitis, and outcome-specific peritonitis definitions. So on this slide, we're dealing with cause-specific peritonitis, and the guidelines recommend that a diagnosis of peritonitis should be described according to its causative organism. So for example, if that was Staphylococcus aureus, it should be referred to as Staphylococcus aureus peritonitis. Culture negative peritonitis is diagnosed when the first two of those ISPD peritonitis criteria are present, but the third is not. So someone who has clinical features consistent with peritonitis and an elevated dialysate white cell count with more than 50% neutrophils, but no organism identified on culture. The ISPD guidelines make two new cause specific peritonitis definitions. The first of those is catheter related peritonitis, which is defined as a peritonitis episode that occurs within three months of a catheter infection, that is an exit site or a tunnel infection, where the same organism is isolated from the exit site of the tunnel infection and in the effluent, or if one of those cultures is allowed to be sterile in the context of a recent antibiotic exposure. And then we also come up with the definition of enteric peritonitis, which is defined as peritonitis arising from an intestinal process a source that involves documented processes such as inflammation, perforation, or ischemia of an intra-abdominal organ. And if a peritonitis occurs in that context and it's culture negative, the guidelines recommend that be uh, considered enteric peritonitis rather than culture peritonitis. So just briefly to um, justify the definition of catheter-related peritonitis, there are a number of studies which have you know, compellingly shown that following an exit site infection, there is an increase in risk of peritonitis that extends as in this, particular, um, in this particular observational cohort, up to nine months after the exit site infection episode. The risk is highest in three months, and the ISPD guidelines working group considered that three months was a reasonable um, cut point for defining uh, catheter-related um, catheter um, uh, peritonitis. So anything, any peritonitis that occurs within three months of an exit site infection or a tunnel infection is considered catheter-related peritonitis. So going from cause-specific peritonitis, there is a second category of time-specific peritonitis. So the timing of the peritonitis is also important to the, um, to the classification and, and diagnosis. And there are three specific time periods. Um, there is prior to PD commencement, but after catheter insertion, which is pre-PD peritonitis. There's a standard PD-related peritonitis, which occurs following the commencement of peritoneal dialysis. And there's a third category of catheter-related, uh, or sorry, catheter insertion-related peritonitis, which occurs within the first 30 days of catheter insertion. So firstly, just to deal with pre-PD uh, PD peritonitis, the ISPD guidelines define that as peritonitis, a peritonitis episode that occurs after the time of catheter insertion, but before commencement of PD treatment. And for the sake of, um, you know, or for the uh, clarification of the diagnosis of commencement of PD treatment, that's defined as the day when the first PD exchange is performed with the intention of continuing long-term PD, uh, PD treatment. So that can either be at the time of PD training, at the time of commencement of PD uh, treatment, either in a hospital or at home, including intermittent peritoneal dialysis, um, uh, with the intention of comm uh, commencing PD long-term. And if uh, we don't count intermittent um, catheter flushing for the uh, main, uh, purpose of maintaining catheter patency as counting the start of PD. So for the purpose of pre-D peritonitis uh, rate porting, time uh, risk starts from the time the catheter is inserted and continues until either PD commencement, PD catheter removal, or patient death, whichever of those comes first. 
So then there's PD related peritonitis, which occurs after PD commencement. So that's, um, the, um, that's and this is uh, for the purpose of standard peritonitis report, uh, rate reporting, we're mainly referring to PD related peritonitis. And time at risk starts from the day of PD commencement, which as I said, is when they start PD training or when they commence PD treatment in hospital at home with the intention of continuing long-term PD therapy. And it continues while they remain on PD, regardless of the setting. So regardless of whether they're in the home, the hospital, a residential aged care facility or anywhere else. And it doesn't matter who's performing the PD, whether it's the patient, a caregiver, a nurse in, uh, in the hospital or, or whoever is doing it. And then thirdly, there's PD catheter insertion related peritonitis, which occurs in the first 30 days after catheter insertion, whether or not the patients commence peritoneal dialysis. So just to make that a little bit clearer, I've um, tried to show that schematically on this diagram. So um, we've got PD catheter insertion, PD initiation, and the break-in period between that time, any peritonitis that occurs during that time period is defined as pre-PD peritonitis. It doesn't count in per standard peritonitis rate reporting, but ISPD guidelines recommend it should be separately reported. PD peritonitis um, occurs following any peritonitis that occurs on peritoneal dialysis after peritoneal commencement. And then down the bottom left, you can see there's also PD catheter insertion related peritonitis, which occurs within the first 30 days after catheter insertion, whether or not the patient has started peritoneal dialysis during that time period. So again, just a brief justification of why we've gone to these definitions. Um, it's because there is a significant uh, and important incidence of peritonitis that occurs in that period before PD commencement. So this recent uh, study published in PDI in 2019 looked at um, patient, you know, peritonitis rates that occurred whilst patients after patients had started training, shown in grey, after or during IPD before they started training, shown in the orange, and then uh, in that pre-PD peritonitis between catheter insertion and PD-related peritonitis, shown in red. And if um, for the pre-D peritonitis, if that wasn't counted, that would underestimate the overall number of peritonitis episodes that occurred by about 0.03 episodes per patient year. So the ISPD uh, uh, guidelines recommend that pre-PD peritonitis is an important period of peritonitis can occur and should be separately reported. And then we come to the third category of outcome specific definitions. So I'll show you on the next slide uh, at the table two in the guidelines, which uh, describe all the outcomes that should be um, measured, monitored and reported by PD units. So just briefly, the, um, we start with medical cure, which is defined as the complete resolution of peritonitis together with none of the following complications, relapse, recurrent peritonitis, catheter removal, hemodialysis transfer for a period of at least 30 days, or patient death. Refractory diagnosis, uh, refractory peritonitis this is the same um, diagno uh, definition as in the 2016 guidelines, which is uh, the presence of persistent cloudy bags or high dialysate uh, effluent leukocyte counts more than five days after appropriate therapy. Recurrent peritonitis is when you get a peritonitis episode that occurs within four weeks of completion of therapy of a prior episode, but with a different organism. And if it's the same organism or at least one sterile episode within that four week period of um, a prior treatment of a peritonitis, that's referred to as relapsing. If uh, the same organism occurs more than four weeks after um, a, a prior peritonitis episode, that's referred to as a repeat peritonitis. We then also have the new definitions of peritonitis associated catheter removal, which is removal of the PD catheter as during the course of treatment of PD peritonitis. Similarly, hemodialysis transfer of any duration that occurs as a result of peritonitis is referred to as peritonitis associated hemotransfer. And any death that occurs within 30 days of peritonitis peritonitis onset or during a hospitalization for peritonitis is referred to as peritonitis associated death. And then finally, any hospitalization that's precipitated by the occurrence of peritonitis for the purpose of peritonitis treatment is defined as peritonitis associated hospitalization. And ISPD guidelines recommend that all PD units measure, monitor and report each of these outcomes. So again, just showing that diagrammatically, um, uh, we define different types of peritonitis according to the time elapsed since the completing antibiotics for prior peritonitis. And the cut point there is less than or equal to four weeks versus more than four weeks 
and whether or not the organism is the same or different. And overall, you know, up to one in six episodes uh, you know, uh, of peritonitis will result in a relapse with the same organism within a four week period, and 5% will um, be involved in a recurrent peritonitis. So the next section is measured, measuring, monitoring, and reporting. So here the ISPD guidelines uh, make recommendations that every program should monitor at least on a yearly basis, the incidence and outcomes of peritonitis, and that we should monitor um, PD-related peritonitis rate, organism-specific peritonitis rates, antimicrobial susceptibilities of the organisms, culture-negative peritonitis, and peritonitis outcomes. And units should also measure and report other peritonitis parameters, including mean time to first peritonitis episode, uh, percentage of patients free of peritonitis per unit time, and as I mentioned earlier, pre-PD peritonitis. And peritonitis rates should be reported as number of episodes per patient year, which is uh, similar to what was reported in the 2016 guidelines. And patient months per episode should no longer be used. To convert patient months per episode into episodes per patient year, you, you um, take 12 and divide by the patient months per episode to get episodes per patient year. Uh, we also suggest that organism specific uh, peritonitis rates should be reported as episodes per patient year. And we've now reduced the target peritonitis rate uh, or the, the maximum peritonitis rate from 0.5 episodes per patient year to 0.4 episodes per patient year at risk. Similarly, with culture negative peritonitis, we recommend that the proportion of culture negative peritonitis episodes should be less than 15% of all peritonitis episodes. So this um, table, which appears in the ISPD guidelines, it just uh, basically shows the various uh, peritonitis measures that should be monitored and reported. And on the far right column, you can see that the, um, the various target rates that have been specifically mentioned. We haven't yet provided uh, rates for pre-PD peritonitis, recurrent relapsing, or, um, or the various other measures, but they are likely to come in the next uh, iteration once we have more data uh, concerning those particular outcomes. The justification for the shifting in the uh, peritonitis threshold from 0.5 to 0.4 episodes has really mainly come from um, uh, two studies. One was the PDOP study, which uh, when you we looked at median peritonitis rates across uh, all seven countries, including uh, low middle income country, countries like uh, Thailand, all rates, uh, all countries achieved uh, a median peritonitis rate of less than 0.4 episodes per patient year. More recently, Mark Marshall's group uh, reported a systematic review and meta-analysis, which showed that there'd been a progressive reduction in uh, peritonitis rates globally uh, from 0.6 episodes per patient year in the early 1990s to 0.33 episodes per patient year in 2019. So we believe that all units should be reasonably able to achieve peritonitis rates less than 0.4 episodes per patient year. And so now finally, we go on to prevention. Um, there are some unchanged recommendations, so I won't dwell on these, only that uh, we still have uh, a 1A recommendation for prophylactic antibiotic administration prior to PD catheter insertion, uh, a 1B recommendation for exit site mupiracin or genomycin um, uh, to prevent um, a catheter related infection, and a 1B recommendation for co prescription of antifungal prophylaxis, either um, nystatin or fluconazole whenever antibiotics are prescribed to patients on PD to prevent fungal peritonitis. We do um, have some, uh, some refined uh, um, recommendations regarding dry and wet contamination. So we've used now the terms more specifically dry and wet contamination uh, with dry contamination being defined as contamination outside a closed PD system, such as a disconnection um, that's, whoops, disconnection that occurs uh, distal uh, to a closed system. And a wet contamination is contamination with an open system where either the dialysis fluid has been infused after a contamination has occurred, or if the catheter administration set has been left open for an extended period. And so it's, uh, the ISPD guidelines recommend that um, advice should be sought from the treating team whenever a contamination episode occurs, wet or dry. And we suggest prophylactic antibiotics after a wet contamination. Uh, of the system to prevent peritonitis. Again, a brief justification for that comes from a number of studies. I've highlighted one here by Yap et al, which uh, reported roughly 550 episodes of contamination, 300 of which were wet, if you look in the graph on the left, 
and 246 of which were dry. And peritonitis only occurred in uh, wet contamination episodes with an overall rate of around 3.1%. So we recommend antibiotics mainly for wet contamination. And in those who um, had wet contamination, non-randomly, 180 received, 182 received antibiotics on the left and 120 received no antibiotics, as you can see in the column on the right. And again, peritonitis only occurred in wet contamination episodes that did not receive any preventative antibiotic treatment. The guidelines have also revised and refined uh, recommendations for invasive um, um, gastrointestinal and gynecological procedures. And we suggest antibiotic prophylaxis occur prior to colonoscopy with a grade 2C recommendation and prior to invasive gynecologic procedures with a level 2D recommendation. And we suggest the drainage of PD fluids uh, to keep the abdomen empty before endoscopic gastrointestinal or invasive or instrumental gynecologic procedures with a 2D recommendation. Again, based, mainly that was based on evidence uh, that um, a lot of PD fluids, uh, particularly bioincompatible fluids, suppress PD host defense mechanisms. When we go into this, um, the, in terms of invasive procedures, the peritonitis risk is highest with gynecologic procedures and variously reported to occur in about a quarter to a third of uh, such procedures. Colonoscopy, the overall rate's about 6% and gastroscopy is around 2 to 3%. For gynecologic procedures, uh, a number of observational non-random cohort studies have shown that um, uh, generally that uh, peritonitis only occur in those patients that uh, do not receive antibiotic prophylaxis. And similarly for colonoscopy, if you look uh, at the bars on the left, again, these were small numbers, not statistically significant, but uh, similar to what most other observational studies have shown that uh, peritonitis primarily only occurs uh, with an overall uh, rate of about 6% in those that don't receive antibiotic prophylaxis. So um, there's been one single randomized control trial of, uh, of prophylactic antibiotics in a single Saudi Arabian center. Didn't show statistically significant result, but the numbers were small. Um, but numerically, there was less peritonitis than those that received antibiotics. Um, we, in terms of training programs, um, we, the, we suggest that uh, the characteristics of an optimal PD training program remain uncertain, so we don't know how, how long, where, when or by whom PD training should be performed, but uh, we do recommend the PD exchange technique and knowledge be regularly reassessed and updated with an emphasis on direct inspection and practice of PD technique. We do make some recommendations for retraining. You'll note that the main difference from previous recommendations is that we don't recommend routine or regular uh, retraining. Uh, again, the justification for that are based on two main studies, the PEPS trial, which was an open label RCT involving 57 Swedish centers, which did not demonstrate that regular refresher training one, three, six, and various time intervals shown on the x-axis made any difference to peritonitis rates. There has been another trial, uh, randomized control trial from uh, the Beijing group, uh, which randomized patients to usual care shown in yellow, to verbal education at uh, two month intervals shown in green, and to or to um, visual inspection and uh, a competency assessment shown in blue. And that study did show that for first non-enteric peritonitis, there was a two thirds reduction in risk uh, uh, in those that did under, uh, underwent uh, technique inspection. But that was very labor intensive, involved two and a half hours of inspection every two months, which um, so we haven't yet, um, we haven't made um, definitive recommendations about routine refresher training. There is a trial underway to look at uh, a structured uh, adult learning principle based training program, the Teach PD trial. It's already over halfway through recruitment, and we should have reporting by 2024 that will inform the next guidelines. We make new recommendations that um, uh, PD patients should take extra precautions to prevent PD uh, peritonitis if domestic cats are kept. We don't prohibit pets uh, if you're a PD patient. Uh, we recognize that's an important uh, quality of life thing for a lot of PD patients, but um, they should keep uh, pets out of the room where PD exchanges take place, particularly to avoid cat scratches of tubing, et cetera. And in terms of other modifiable risk factors, we make two new recommendations that uh, both 2C are great. 
that, uh, we, uh, that uh, hyperkalemia should be avoided and treated to reduce the risk of peritonitis, and that uh, the use of histamine to receptor antagonists should be avoided or limited. The evidence for potassium supplementation. Uh, this wasn't uh, this. This trial has only just come out, but it does um, it does vindicate the recommendation. Uh, this involves six Thai centres, um, which uh, were either treated proactively with regular potassium supplementation, shown in red, to maintain levels between four to five millimoles per litre, versus a, a reactive strategy of uh, giving potassium supplementation only if the level fell below three point five. And you can see the cumulative incidence of peritonitis in that um, reactive group shown in blue was significantly higher. And for H2 receptor antagonists, there's been a systematic review and meta-analysis of six randomized control trials, which uh, shows uh, there's a 40% increased risk of peritonitis associated with H2 receptor antagonist, uh, receptor antagonist therapy, possibly related to alteration of intestinal permeability or alteration of the gut microbiome. So just to conclude, um, we, the ISPD guidelines, at least the first half, strongly recommend the use of the ISPD standardized peritonitis definition. It recommends four specific categories of core specific peritonitis, three specific cavities, cavity, um, categories of time specific peritonitis, pre-PD, PD related, and catheter insertion related and a, a number of outcome specific uh, uh, peritonitis, which I won't go into because we've already covered. There are new targets. So the peritonitis rate should be less than 0.4 episodes per patient year, culture negative less than 15%, percent peritonitis free within a year, a one year period, it should be more than 80%, and catheter insertion related peritonitis should be less than 5%. And finally, there are recommendations for prevention, particularly with respect to wet contamination procedures, training and retraining, treatment of hyperkalemia, and H2 receptor antagonists. I'll hand over to uh, my co-chair, Philip Lee, and um, we'll take questions at the end. So thank you very much. Okay, so thank you, David and Jolanta. And uh, it's my pleasure to share with you the latest uh, ISPD 2022 update guideline. So David has already shared with you the initial part, including the definitions and also the prevention. And my task is mainly more on the treatment. So first I have to thank the whole group of my colleagues in the working group, uh, which is, uh, who are from uh, all over the world and including nephrologists, uh, microbiologists, uh, infectious disease uh, specialists, uh, pharmacists, nurse, as well as a patient partner. So it's a very important uh, diversity in the group and uh, help us to uh, have a lot of the input from all of them. So this was a 2016 guideline and it's already six years. So we now have the new one. So on my part, I will probably update on some of the novel diagnostic techniques, update on the recommendation of empirical antibiotic selection, about the use of adjunctive oral and acetylcysteine therapy for aminoglycoside. Say something about the treatment of peritonitis in APD patients. Something about the consideration of expectant management in patients longer than five days of peritonitis. And a whole number of the different individual organisms, which I would spend some time talking into this. Now, first about the APD. We all know that uh, when uh, David mentioned about the diagnostic criteria uh, for the uh, peritonitis, but for APD, we all know that uh, it may not be the case that every time we have an absolute white cell count of uh, 100 more than uh, 100 uh, per microliter. So the more important point is about the percentage of the polymorphs, more than 50%. In the new ISPD guidelines, we think that some of the APD patients, they may not have a daytime exchange so we actually suggest that the use of one liter of dialysis solutions should be infused, drill for about two hours, and then drain for inspection and laboratory testing. And that's for the APD patients. Now, throughout these few years after the 2016 guideline, there are a number of novel diagnostic techniques that has been explored in the early diagnosis of peritonitis, including leukocyte esterase reagent strips, the biomarker assays, the MMP8 and 9, 
neutrophil gelatinase associated lipoquinolin for calcitonin, PCR for the bacterial derived DNA fragments, PCR with electrospray ionization mass spectrometry assay, 16SR uh, ribosomal RNA gene sequencing, matrix assisted laser desorption ionization time of flight mass spectrometry, and pathogen specific email fingerprints. But to be fair, that up to now, none of them has actually proved to be superior to the conventional techniques in the clinical setting. I highlight some of the very uh, interesting and important uh, sort of uh, reports. Uh, both of them have been in KI. This was the one uh, published in the 2017 about the immune fingerprinting. So they used top five biomarkers to try to type the causative organisms, including, for example, CNS, streptococcus gram negative, and also some of them with technique failure. But at, the, at this moment, that the use of this and also the next one, the point of care testing, using two types of the biomarkers, the IL-6 as well as MMP-8. So this is just the uh, dipsticks into one of the wick into the dialysate and after five minutes to, to look at it. I think nowadays we are very familiar with all this COVID testing to read the line. And then we actually, uh, uh, this is a point of care test, which should be useful. But from what we read from the uh, reports at the moment that the immune fingerprints probably can tell you some about the organisms, but there's no information on the antibiotic resistance. We still need a lot of the medical machine learning algorithms in order to characterize the pathogens, including the gram negative, streptococcal and the coagulase negative style. For the point of care device using MMP8 and IL-6 is probably a more useful in excluding peritonitis with a very high negative predictive value of over 98%. So let's turn to the empirical selection of antibiotics. The first one is that we want to recommend that the uh, uh, peritonitis treatment should be empirically started as soon as possible using either intraperitoneal or systemic route, and this is 1B. The usual empirical antibiotic treatment uh, with gram-positive and gram-negative coverage, I think is the same as last time. But this time we add on one that the use of a monotherapy or cathetin may be an acceptable alternative for empirical antibiotic regimens is 2B. I'll show you some of the data uh, as follows. So this is the flow chart as reported in the ISBD guideline. So start the IDP antibiotics as soon as possible, gram-positive, gram-negative coverage. We suggest this time the monotherapy with a fourth generation caprosporin may be an alternative. And obviously we always recommend an antifungal prophylaxis. Now in the issue of the PROM empirical antibiotics treatment, there are two studies as highlighted here. The first one is of 160 peritonitis episode. The contact to treatment time was independently associated with treatment failure. So for each hour of delay, the risk of PD failure of death is actually higher by about 5.5%. Another retrospective study, 109 peritonitis episode, a delay by 24 hours, it actually conferred a threefold risk of peritoneal catheter removal. This is shown by the graphs as here. It is the study by Oki. ST is the time, the duration from the sign of peritonitis to treatment with appropriate antibiotics. You can see that for catheter removal, if the ST is more than 24 hours, significantly is higher than the ST is less than 24 hours. And likewise, for the composite outcome or catheter removal or relapse or recurrence is the same. Now, how about the use of cathepin as a monotherapy? And up to now, there are two randomized control trials and one observational prospective studies as highlighted here have used IP cathepin as a monotherapy. So altogether, this shows that the cathepin dosing actually show a primary response rate of exceeding 80% on day 10. So that is all has been uh, reported. So the latest actually from the uh, study from Thailand, actually with eight PD centers, randomized control trial of cathepin as monotherapy versus the cathesoline and cathesidine. So in terms of primary response, complete cure rate, death, relapse, recurrence, and catheter removal, all shows comparable between the two. And so that's why we actually make a recommendation from the ISBD on the possible alternative using uh, cathepin or fourth generation cathosporin. 
This is the table showing all the doses of the different antibiotics in terms of intraperitoneal as well as intravenous or oral. I'm not going to draw into this. You can read it easily from the, from the guideline. Now then we talk about the use of the antibiotics. The first one, obviously, we all know that IP antibiotics is a preferred route. But if you use IP amylogycoside, we recommend use a daily intermittent dosing to reduce the toxicity. The prolonged causes of IP amylogycoside be avoided, that's one C. And then we probably spend more time to talk about this new guideline about the use of adjunctive oral anesthetocysteine therapy to reduce the amylogycoside and auto toxicity. We all know that there has been quite a few trials shows that the use of amylogycoside did not actually significantly reduce or have a nephrotoxicity, but the autotoxicity is really very real. The last one is there are insufficient evidence to make recommendation to whether patient on APD should be temporarily switched to CAPD during treatment of peritonitis that is not graded. Now, going back to the autotoxicity related to amylogycoside, this is the recommended dosage of uh, the amylogycoside as an intermittent dose, as said, we don't recommend continuous dosing. So a major concern is the use of amylogycoside causing autotoxicity. And that can be a uh, vestibular toxicity or cochlear damage, as well as uh, the, uh, the toxicity can actually happen even with a therapeutic serum concentrations. That means that you may not need to have a very uh, toxic range of the amylogycoside. So this is a very early study showing the use of gentamicin leading to octotoxicity in a Dutch uh, study, showing 34% of them actually have ultra high frequency hearing loss, and 8% have hearing loss in the lower speech frequencies, compared with a, a, a vancomycin, which uh, is a lower range. And there's also vestibular toxicity in this reported, which can cause patients to have severe dizziness, vertigo, loss of balance, positive rhombus sign, as well as the need for support for walking. Some of the patients actually complained they could not resume driving after the vestibular toxicity of aminoglycoside. So this is the meta-analysis or the report from the use of uh, n acetylcysteine in reducing amylogycoside-induced autotoxicity. All of these use 600 milligram twice daily in the uh, dosage, and they can reduce the hearing loss in these studies. So that's why this time we're suggesting the use of the n cysteine in reducing amylogycoside-induced autotoxicity. The next one is about the antibiotic stability uh, uh, in the PD fluid. So, this is in the table showing you that the different types of the antibiotics in either dextro based or icodestrin based in room temperature or under refrigeration. Usually under refrigeration, the stability is actually higher. And also the comparability with the different antibiotics mixed in the same PD bag. Uh, gentamicin compared with cefazolin or vancomycin, captasin compatible with cefazolin and vancomycin. We actually recently published in Clinical Kidney Journal that the review of uh, uh, the stability and the comparability of the antibiotics in PD solutions, namely uh, the one that I showed you earlier in the antibiotics related to PD solution, icodestrin or PD neutral in different types of temperature and also how long they would stay be stable and also the compatibility with the different uh, antibiotics. So if you are interested, you can go to read this uh, uh, paper. Now then next turn to the APD. Uh, the use of APD in the extrapolation of the antibiotic dosing is not recommended. One of which is because APD have a greater peritoneal antibiotic adherence. So it's in worry that the implication of the shorter antibiotic half life during cycle exchanges will not be adequate uh, in terms of the serum and dialysate drug concentration throughout the 24 hours. And with such, there may be a potential underdosing and that especially for antibiotics at exhibit the time dependent killing. So we should dose the patient such that allows antibiotic concentrations to exceed the MIC for at least 50% of the treatment time. And sufficient trial time is needed between, for example, vancomycin should be trialed at least for four hours, probably better off for six hours. And this is a report from the Thai study in PDI in 2020. They studied the use of capsulin and captasin 
each of 2,500 milligram added to five liter bag, and that translates into 500, 500 milligram per liter uh, in PD fluid. And then they did five exchanges, two liter PD fluid over 10 hours of APD cycles. So they measured the dialysate, capsaicin, and capsaicin levels and try to see whether they can be sustained above the target peritoneal concentration of two milligram per liter for capsaicin and eight milligram per liter for capsaicin. So this is the results. And this is capsaicin, this is capsaicin. You can see that from the outflow that they can all be maintained above the capsaicin uh, target concentration and the capsaicin target concentration. So it is one way of how to handle this. The other adjunctive treatment that we suggest is that uh, icodestrin should be considered for volume overload, which occurs during acute peritonitis. We still confirm that augmented peritoneal lavage probably should not be performed for improving outcome in the peritonitis. So going back to the icodestrin, and that's probably based on one of the studies that we perform using uh, uh, icodestrin in patient peritonitis. We can actually see that icodestrin can achieve a better ultrafiltration and fluid control during acute peritonitis complicating CAPD. We also want to look into the primary cure rate, but then we see that the primary cure rate in this randomized study did not actually differ between the icodestrin and the original glucose based dialysis solutions. However, a recent PDOP study reported in AJKD 2022, they actually looked into the facility percentage of patients using icodestrin. So for every 10% increase in the facility that are using icodestrin, they have a 1.06 unadjusted uh, sort of a, an adjusted uh, uh, improvement in the uh, peritonitis cure. So that gives some suggestion that may be useful in the per uh, peritonitis uh, uh, outcome. But we also have another uh, meta-analysis or the Cochrane database uh, systemic review from Australia showing that there's no effect of icodestrin compared with standard-based glucose-based dialysate on peritonitis rate. And this was also based on very low certainty evidence. So all in all, that we don't think that agrodestrin uh, has an outcome benefit in terms of the peritonitis. But then it does have the benefit, especially during peritonitis. Patients' ultrafiltration will be poor with volume overload. That, that agrodestrin will be useful for this group of patients. Now for the refractory peritonitis. The usual ISPD guideline recommendation is that the PD character should be removed in refractory peritonitis episode, defined as failure of the PD efferent to clear after five days of healthy antibiotics, so that's 1D. But however, uh, we do have studies, and then they are show later, and so much so that we suggest observation for antibiotic effect longer than five days is appropriate if the PD efferent white cell count is decreasing towards normal instead of mandatorily remove the catheter after five days. So we do give a bit of a window period for the patients to recover if there's actually a trend of improvement. And this actually also come from a Thai study and they look into a group of peritonitis patients and see their response to recovery. And they divide them into early response, delay response and failure. And so that they actually find that one fifth of the cases, they actually show delay response that is, they have 34% reduction in the effluent white cell count by day five, as shown here, but not which to the extent of less than 100, mil, 100 per uh, uh, millimeter by day five. So that means uh, we do see a group of patients who may not fail, but then if you follow strictly what we uh, prescribe, that uh, by day five, we don't, they don't improve to uh, uh, total uh, remission, you will remove the catheter. So in this group of patients, you do see a trend of improvement you will delay the, the, the decision and try to see if the patient can have a delay response and then uh, can delay and then uh, without uh, a catheter removal. Now then we go to individual organisms. This one is a coagulase negative star. I think the important thing is about the duration of 14 days of treatment. Well, for the last few years after the 2016 uh, uh, guideline, the leading cause of the pathogenic CNS or coagulous negative staph is actually Staphylococcus epidermidis, followed by Staphylococcus hemolyticus. But then we see that the increase in the methicillin resistant rate of this CNS and then can be in the range of 50% or up to 70%.
So that is the rationale for some of the centers who probably would like to use empirical vancomycin for the CNS in the cohort. The second organism is the Corinbacterium peritonitis. We suggest that the Corinbacterium peritonitis be treated with two weeks antibiotics. But then some of the antibiotic strains that are particularly resistant with beta leptin, like the Corinbacterium JKM, they should be treated with vancomycin. This is the Australian New Zealand data, and then report the largest number of 162 current bacterium from the NSAID data. And they found that the outcome of the current bacterium peritonitis were not associated with the type of initial antibiotics selected if they are not resistant to uh, capasolin. So i.e. vancomycin versus capasolin is about the same. And the duration of antibiotics, regardless whether it's less than 14 days or more than 14 days is the same. So that's why we come up with the suggestion that the treatment should be two weeks, but then whether it, the organism itself is sensitive to the uh, antibiotics. So the treatment should be vancomycin if we are seeing some of the quite resistant organism to beta lactams like the Corinbacterium JKM and Corinbacterium striatum. But if they are concomitant exercise or tunnel infection, then an early character removal for Corinbacterium peritonitis is recommended. In the next time to enterococcus peritonitis, we suggest the enterococcal peritonitis be treated with three weeks of oral amoxicillin or IP vancomycin. But for VRE or vancomycin resistant enterococcus, which are ampicillin resistant, we suggest the use of either oral or IV linicillin or IP daptomycin or tycopanin. So the enterococcus species are shown here. There can be single organism or polymicrobial uh, enterococcal. So for ampicillin sensitive, we use oral amoxicillin. For ampicillin resistant and are vancomycin sensitive, we use IP vancomycin. But if they are vancomycin resistant, then probably we'll be sought to oral linicillate or IP daptomycin. But all of them require treatment of 21 days. This is the data from our own center with CETO's uh, report that of 105 episodes of enterococcal peritonitis Actually, the primary response rate to oral amoxicillin is 76% and to IP vancomycin 85%. Compicure rate oral amoxicillin 55%, IP vancomycin very similar, 55%. And one particular mention is about the treatment for vancomycin resistant enterococcus VRE. So one possibility is the use of an IV delvavancin. So this is the data showing the delvavancin given IV and then the plasma level concentration gradually drop. But then at the same time, you can see actually after the IV, the dialysate, the preventing concentration actually rise and maintain for a certain period of time. So the use of one dose of 1.5 gram uh, dabavancy intravenously, or either uh, use one gram followed by 500 milligram on day seven, have a very good coverage for gram positive bacteria and that do not need to adjust according to the renal dysfunction. The next turn to Pseudomonas peritonitis. We suggest that Pseudomonas peritonitis be treated with two antibiotics with different mechanisms, but for a period of three weeks. And we suggest they should have a, a character removal if they are concomitant exercise and tunnel infection. If there's no clinical response after five days, we suggest that be treated with early character removal instead of using three antibiotics as an attempt to salvage level 2D uh, uh, evidence. So we look into this non-fermenting uh, 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 gram-negative organisms. All of them require treatment for 21 days. We look into Pseudomonas, Acinetobacter, Stenotrophomonas. So Pseudomonas with two effective antibiotics. This is partly based on one of the studies performed by our own center reported that the, despite the decline in incidence of Pseudomonas peritonitis, the proportion of bacterial isolate being antibiotic resistant remains static during the study period. We also note that there's no difference in the compicure rate between episodes treated with three instead of two antibiotics. So the cure rate is the same. So that's why the prompt removal character is used in order to avoid unnecessarily protracted cause of antibiotics and prolong peritoneal inflammation which if you don't do that, the residual renal function or nutritional status may worsen, and also the peritoneal permeability 
will switch to a high transport state. The next is turn to acinetobacter peritonitis. We suggest that the carbapenem resistant acinetobacter be treated with aminoglycoside and a salvaptin containing agent 2C. Now for acinetobacter, we are using this type of uh, antibiotics, but then particularly wearing is the CRAB, which is the carbapenem resistant acinetobacter pneumoniae. And we also need to treat for 21 days. In the past few years, actually one of the reports from Hong Kong also showed that the existence of multi-drug resistant uh, acinetobacter, MDRA is white, and the CRA carbapenem resistant acinobacter in black, and they all show a significant increase from the period of 2004 to the period in 2015. And it's been also shown that by the Australian data that the acinobacter peritonitis, especially the pericomicrobial ones, if they are present, they have a high chance of catheter removal and also hemodialysis transfer. The next one is the stenotrophomonas motophilia peritonitis. And we suggest that use cotrimoxazole 2D to 3. And we suggest it to treat it with two different classes of antibiotics for at least three weeks. As shown here, two effective drugs for three weeks. The standard dose of cotrimoxazole can be in combination of fluoroconolones and uh, intravenous uh, timentin, venocycline, tigacycline, capitacin are all potentially useful. Then we turn to the enteric gram-negative bacterial peritonitis. And once again, we need to treat them for a period of three weeks. For those that are sensitive, the use of, for example, capitacin, capitacin, or oxybuproxacin is also good. But there are three types that are more likely to be resistant, including the ESBL producing, the MC beta lactamase producing, and the carbapenemase producing. The ESBL E. coli uh, uh, sort of uh, uh, prevalence around the world has been rising. And this is shown in this world map as seen in the red, for example, in Southeast Asia and South Asia and part of Africa, it can be over 50%. The others, for example, the pink one is 25 to 50%. This is a recent study from Southern China in Guangzhou showing you that the ESBL rate was 34% in the year 2011, but 47% in the year 2018, significant increase. And the ESBL producing E. coli have over 50% of drug resistance. And also from the year 2018, the E. coli peritonitis in their study show a significant increase in refractory peritonitis, character removal, as well as treatment failure. So there are the spice organisms, which many of you may have known, including Seracia, Providentia, Indopositive Proteus, Citrobacter, and Trobacter, the acronym. So the spice organisms are the primary producers of MC beta lactamases. If you're not sure what exactly what MC is, I spent about 30 seconds talking about it. So M actually is the gene that produces ampicillin resistance in bacteria and through production of beta lactamase. For those who confer with the resistance of caprosporin, they call that group C. So the MC beta lactamase is the one that have ampicillin resistance, in particular resistant to caprosporin. And you can see how sort of a, a resistant they are. So this is actually from the gram-negative bacteria, gram-positive bacteria showing the different mechanisms that the uh, bacteria can become resistant to the antibiotics. And highlight over here is the MC, as well as the ESBL, the KPC, which stands for Krebsiella pneumonia carbapenemase, and the MBL, which is a metal uh, beta lactamase. So all these confer sort of a significant resistance to, an uh, to the bacteria, to the drugs. And even more difficult is the carbapenemase producing enterobacteriaceae. And with that, we do need to have a good susceptibility profile and the type of the enzymes they have. And we do need expert advice from the microbiologists as well as the infectious disease specialists. And this is the data from the UK pharmacies uh, 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 guideline. So fungal peritonitis. I think the usual yeast we use fluconazole, but the resistant one will use intravenous echinocannon, as well as uh, oral uh, variconazole. 
some of the recent data since now 2016, this is from an Italian uh, study, and then 50% of the pathogenic yeast is actually candida parasitosis, followed by candida albicans, 21%. Another study from Brazil also showed that uh, candida parasitosis is actually the leading cause, 39%. In the Spanish study, they also look into, interestingly, the biofilm production, and they found that the biofilm production is actually higher in the candida albicans group, higher than the candida parasitosis. But because of a very high biofilm production, that we suggest the immediate candida removal is actually the best option in order to reduce the high mortality and the morbidity of the fungal peritonitis. Finally, tuberculous peritonitis. The usual uh, mycobacterium be tuberculous, we suggest anti TB drugs instead of PD character removal. And these are the different anti TB drugs. But more difficult is actually the non tuberculous mycobacterial peritonitis. And this is the, what we call the MTM. And then this one, we suggest the use of the Sinusin stain, especially for those who are actually have a persistent culture negative peritonitis. And the treatment of these NTM peritonitis should be with effective antibiotics as well as candida removal. This is uh, one of our recent reports in, uh, in Prince of Wales Hospital showing that 37% of the NTM is because of Mycobacterium chelonae, followed by about 30% of Mycobacterium uh, uh, fortuitum. And for the sensitivity of the antibiotics, all of them were sensitive to amicacin but there are high resistance to fluoropinolones and uh, capucitin, as well as carifomycin. But obviously, if you need to give a long sort of duration of amicacin, we are worried about this uh, potential octotoxicity, which I earlier on mentioned. So in the review of about five series, actually the portion of the tank of candida removal ranged from 75 to 100%. The portion of cases resumed to PD is only 7% to 37% while the duration of anti-NTM antibiotics in the range is median is 2 to 2.2, but the range can be from one month to more than eight months treatment. So we recommend that the two agents should be given for at least six weeks and usually eight weeks and remove the PD character for the treatment in the combination with the antibiotics treatment. And we can actually speculate less than 20% of patients could be resumed on PD. So in the last 30 minutes, I highlight to you about the novel diagnostic techniques in peritonitis, the different empirical antibiotic selection, the use of n cysteine therapy to reduce aminoglycoside autotoxicity, about the treatment of patients who are on APD, about consideration of expectant management of patients who have uh, PD influence still more than 100 on day five, and the different types of microorganisms. Finally, I think we always do need to do uh, have a future potential research uh, uh, subjects. So we should look into the possibility of reduce further the culture negative peritonitis. I think the novel diagnostic tools, including prognostic tools, are very important, despite at the moment they are not yet into the clinical usefulness. The IP drug dosing for APD opposed to CAPD leads to further study. Randomized control trials for efficacy and safety of different antibiotics should be given, uh, and then should be better strategies to prevent peritonitis with the RCT. Antibiotic prophylaxis before gastroscopy and dental procedures have not been done, and that you should have a clinical trials to look into this, and the patient perspectives, as well as recommendations for some of the spots uh, that are uh, 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 used by the patients are potential research questions. So with that, I will once again thank all my working group of the uh, uh, nephrologists, nurses, microbiologists, infectious disease specialists, pharmacists, and patient partners. And finally, I thank my group of uh, investigators from my own hospital, including CCC, to KM Chow, and all the other staff in the Carroll and Richard UPD Research Center. Thank you very much for your attention. And. Uh... Thanks a lot, uh, David and Philip. Uh, David was extremely busy answering all the questions who appeared in Q&A session. And I do hope that everyone is satisfied. And also uh, there is last question uh, on the Q&A. 
Regarding antibiotic stability in PD solutions, uh, would that mean that a patient can go home with this, let's say three first days of treatment already in his PD solution bags? Sorry, think, Philip, I tried to answer them all, yeah, but yeah, that you, one's, uh, that question's got your, <laughs> that question, that question, you're, you're, um, so, you're so efficient. <laughs> that question's got your name all over it because uh, yeah, you, um, your Hong Kong pharmacy team was very good with the PD stability. <laughs> well, I think the question uh, whether this is possible, uh, it really depends on what type of uh, 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 antibiotics you are giving to the patient. And obviously it is uh, possible, uh, especially with the stability. But then uh, I think at the moment, Hong Kong, we are still uh, using the, uh, uh, the type of the uh, management that uh, including the support from our community nurses who can go to help with the uh, patients in terms of the uh, introduction of the antibiotics as well as the administration of the uh, PD fluid. And uh, last, uh, can antibiotics be left in icodextrin for 12 hours intraperitoneally? I don't think there is a contraindication for that. Mm -hmm. yeah, no, the short answer is yes. Um, because we're just in time, um, I think we just went for the record high, reaching, I don't know, close to 1,000, which was never, ever recorded. And uh, as we answered in the Q&A, all the guidelines are available on in the PubMed in PDI on ISPD website. And once again, all of us, we would like to thank a lot, the, uh, David, Philip and the whole team for sharing the updated guidelines. And thanks a lot for the audience and uh, honestly for excellent chat and very vivid and fruitful discussion. Thank you very much and have a nice day, evening or late evening. Bye-bye. Thank you. And thanks for chairing, Yolanta. Great job. Thanks, everyone. <laughs> Thank you, everyone. Thank you so much. So uh, are we um, with off, 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 not live now? <laughs>